Hello, everybody. Uh, this is uh, Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Uh, welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Today, I'm going to begin something that uh, I've wanted to do for a long, long time now, and I've kind of procrastinated on it, and that's uh, to study and teach the book of John. Uh, I have... Uh, Many times over the years in, in other videos, I have um, taken the position that the book of John is the single most important book in the entire Bible. Um, I have asked the question uh, to people in a video, what are your favorite books of the Bible? If you want to pick your first, second, third books, and it seemed like uh, many, many people do choose the book of John uh, as their top pick or one of their favorites. Not only favorites, but one of the most important books. Uh, I've even phrased it this way. If, if you were told that um, every record of the Bible would be destroyed, it wouldn't exist, but you had the power to save one of the books and which one would you pick? For me, there's no, no doubt that it would be the book of John. Uh, and the reason, uh, the reason for that basically is pretty simple. Uh, the book of John does two of the most important things. And, and one is it, it teaches us who Jesus is better than any other book, particularly the first chapter of the book of John. If you want to learn about who Jesus is and the, the, the deity of Jesus Christ, uh, the beginning of ch chapter one uh, is, is one of the most important places to go. The only part of the Bible I think that explains the deed of Christ even better and more completely would be the first chapter of Hebrews. So uh, I certainly suggest uh, you go to those two places to understand who Jesus is. Uh, and then the other thing that the book of John does, uh, and the, the, you can get this from other places in the Bible, many other places, but the book of John, more than any other book, tells us what Jesus has done for us and, and, and what we need to do so that we can be saved and have eternal life. In fact, um, uh, rather than starting with uh, chapter one, verse one, normally that's the way you'd start studying a book right from the beginning. But I, I jump way ahead because at the end of the, near the end of the book, uh, John tells us why he wrote this book. So let me start off by reading that. It says, John chapter 20, verse 31. But these are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through his name. There is no other book of the Bible that makes that kind of a claim that says this book was written for this specific reason. And that is to tell us how we can have life through the name of Jesus Christ and believing in him. So if a person wants to know who Jesus is, if a person wants to know how to receive eternal life and go to heaven, the book of John is where they need to go. Now, not everybody agrees with that uh, statement. Uh, there's um, a group of people whom I, I, I love because they are true saints. They are no doubt born again believers and saved and yet they don't understand the Bible correctly. Uh, I, I have a playlist t 
titled Paul Onlyism Debunked. Paul Onlyism is a term that I came up with uh, to, I think, better describe a group of people that have traditionally been called hyper dispensationalists. Um, and even a more extreme viewpoint are the people who are called ultra dispensationists. But um, these Paul onlyists, um, many of them were some of my closest friends on YouTube the first year or two that I was here. I've been on YouTube for seven or eight years now. The first couple of years, uh, the Paul onlyists were some of my best friends, and probably 10 or 20 of them I knew very well. And uh, they certainly do teach that salvation is a free gift, that it's not earned that through, through our religious works, that it's faith alone in Christ alone. Um, so in, in that respect, I'm 100% uh, percent, uh, in agreement with them. Where I had to separate company from them and draw a line and take a stand against them was their position that uh, we, we can only get salvation through the writings of the Apostle Paul. And even, even more specifically, one particular thing that the Apostle Paul wrote in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses uh, 3 and 4. So these Paul only us, they... Um, they basically dismiss the rest of the Bible and say, it's not to us. It's for us. We can learn from the rest of the Bible, but it's not to us. The rest of the Bible is just to the Jewish people. And they say it's a, it's a different, totally different message, a different, a different uh, type of gospel, a different way of getting saved. Uh, uh, so my, my first conflict came with them when um, I would say in a video and quote something from the Gospel of John. Uh, and even though they love the overall message, if I, if I dared to quote something from the book of John, their, their hair stood on end. They, they, were, they, they were immediately uh, upset that I, how could I talk about the book of John? How could I reference it? in terms of salvation. And uh, so they were, every time I did mention John, or for that matter, any other books apart from what Paul wrote, uh, there was an immediate uh, response where I needed to be corrected. And to keep peace, I, I kept my mouth shut uh, and didn't argue back with him over it for the period of at least a, a year before I realized that I really needed to stand up for John and Jesus and Peter and, and the, the other people who also have this uh, message of salvation for us today. Uh, so I started making some videos defending the book of John, defending uh, the, the teachings of Jesus and uh, Peter and John. And it eventually turned into a playlist in a series called Paul Only Isn't Debunked. So I, I hope if you haven't seen that series, if you are a Paul Onlyus, or if you are listening to Paul Onlyus and you're you don't know better, you don't know understand the the uh, uh, the problems with their teachings. I hope you will look at my playlist, Paul Onlyism debunked, so that you can see that uh, all of their claims are really really easily refuted. I I, I know their teachings, you know as well as they do because I've watched hundreds of their videos over the years and studied their, their teaching. And it's, it's just, it's, it's so easy to prove them wrong. So I hope you'll go do that. And so I think this is kind of an introduction to the book of John. And I, I, and the reason I have to say that is because when I read John 20, 
31, as I did it and say that John is writing that the reason he wrote this book is so that we can learn how to be saved. Uh, well, immediately there's a, a faction, Paulius are not a large percentage. I, I would say that they're probably of all, all the people who are teaching here on YouTube. It's, it's probably, you know, five or 10% of them that, uh, so, it, but the size is not the issue, uh, but, but you probably will encounter them. Uh, and, and uh, but they would argue, well, Brother Luke, you know, that's, uh, that's your, this is all wrong what you're saying because this, in John, it's a different gospel and it's to the Jewish people. But watch my playlist, Paul only is debunked and you'll see that uh, their, their claims are false. So this is the important thing for you to understand. As we go through the book of John, we're going to learn who Jesus is and we're going to learn how to get saved. And, and uh, John, as I said, claims, these are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through his name. No other book claims that it was written specifically so that you can receive life everlasting. Um, now, the book of John, uh, it is in the Bible, it's one of 66 books. And I guess it depends on which translation you look at, how they, they title it. I don't know what it said in the original manuscripts. We don't have the originals. We have some old, old copies. Uh, but um, I don't know if there was a title in it. But here, see here in, in uh, this KJV, it, they title it, the gospel according to St. John. Uh, now they also say in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, it says the gospel according to St. Matthew, the gospel according to St. Luke. Well, that's not scripture, that title, that's some, the, the, the people who published this, or maybe it was the KJV translators that came up with that as a title, I'm, I'm not sure. But I, I don't believe that was the, the book of John had that title when it was first written. Uh, the important thing to know is that this is the Apostle John who wrote this book. And uh, he, he was with Jesus through his whole ministry, and he was the only apostle that was faithful to Jesus to the, to the end. He was the only apostle with Jesus at the cross. Um, when was the book written? Well, there is a dispute over that too. If it was, was it written before 70 AD, before the destruction of the Jewish temple? Was it written at the end of the century, uh, 90 to 95 AD? Well, that brings up another argument about uh, uh, you know, end times, eschatology. That, that's the people argue over that. That's very important for their their position, uh, because if it was written, um, if, if it was written after, after uh, the temple was destroyed, uh, then it seems odd that uh, John, his epistles, and his book of Revelation, uh, it seems that uh, it, it would have been mentioned. It's such an, a significant thing that the temple was destroyed, that there would be a reference that the temple was destroyed back 20, 25 years ago. And there, there's nothing in any of John's writings that reference that. So uh, many people would conclude that it must have been written before the temple was destroyed. But the exact date is not something I want to try to prove right now. Uh, now, I have, uh, in terms of describing who Jesus is, I said in chapter one, we're going to learn uh, better than any place except for the first chapter of Hebrews, we're going to learn about who Jesus is. But I also have a number of playlists that I put together on this uh, subject. One is called uh, the identity of Jesus. And it's a, 
a lot of videos that show that um, I think it's very, very thorough to understand completely, more completely, because uh, not only do we take the Gospel of John but, and also Hebrews, but all throughout the scriptures, the names and titles and descriptions of Jesus so you can really understand who he is. So I hope that if, as we go through this first chapter, uh, if your interest is piqued and you say, I want to know more about who Jesus is, I want to understand this better, then uh, you can watch this playlist, The Identity of Jesus. Um, this is a critical question, who he is. On my statement of faith um, that I put on, publish on every one of my videos, it says that uh, Jesus is the eternal God Almighty. He is manifest in the flesh as the Son of God. And the idea of Jesus being eternal is essential. And because if, he's, if he was not eternal, then he must have had a beginning. And if he had a beginning, then he couldn't be God. He would be a creature, a, a creation, something that God created. So we, we, one of the best places to go to understand the eternality of Jesus uh, is to, at, uh, uh, in the book of John, the first chapter, the fir very first couple of verses. As we'll do that in a minute. But then, uh, so I, I have a playlist titled The Deity of Christ Proven. And the reason I put that together is because there are a lot of people who either um, are not Christians and, and, and they, they don't even pretend to be Christians, but they um, diminish Jesus by saying he's just a prophet or he's just a great moral teacher or he, he, is, a, uh, a, he is God with a small g, as a Jehovah Witness would say that, that he, he's not God Almighty, but he is a God or Mormons who believe he's a creation too. So it's important to understand that Jesus is not created. He's not a created being, a creature like we are. He is eternal God Almighty. Uh, now, did he always exist as Jesus? He always existed. Um, there, that is essential to understand and, and believe. But did he always exist as Jesus and and the Jesus, the Son of God. I have a playlist I did about six months or a year ago, and it answers a question that I was not familiar with. For, I've been a Christian since December of 1986. So it's 29 years coming up. And I've been studying the Bible all these years. And yet, Every once in a while, there's a new question, a new topic that, that comes up that surprises me. That I, I, I was not familiar with it. And the question is, the, is Jesus, is the Son of God eternal or is it incarnational? And the question is, eternal sonship versus incarnational sonship. Um, and I have a, that's the title of a playlist I did on that a few months back. And I hope you'll watch that. And I believe that whichever side of that question you end up siding with, even if you, you, you may not even be able to make a decision after you look at both sides of it, you may be undecided. But regardless of, of your conclusion on that question, um, it's not essential as long as we, you do agree that Jesus is eternal. He is not a creature. He did not come into being at some point in time. Uh, but, but did he exist prior to the incarnation as the word, which we're going to see here in John 1.1, 1, 1, uh, or did he exist throughout all eternity as the son? That's the question. Did he become the son at the at the uh, incarnation when he was born as Jesus in the manger was, was that when he became the son of God. And prior to that, was he the word of God? 
that's not something I'm going to go into now. I, I, as I said, I have a playlist on that. I found the subject very interesting and I have an opinion on it now, but you'll have to watch the video, the series to, um, to decide for yourself, which is correct. So this is kind of a, like an introductory uh, foundation here before we get started. But uh, so please watch the playlist, um, The Identity of Jesus, another playlist, Deity of Christ Proven, another playlist, um, um, uh, Eternal Sonship versus Incarnational Sonship. These will all help you to better understand who Jesus is. But the first thing we learn in the Gospel of John is, I'll read this in the KJV, and if I think it'll be helpful, I'll look at the Amplified. Uh, John 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word. Now, that the word, Word, is in capitals. Um, now, when, when the um, scriptures were originally written, I don't think they capitalized. And it's, uh, so the capitalization is uh, determined by the uh, translators and editors. But uh, in the King James here, it says in the beginning was the word and it's in a capital W. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God. And the word was God. Uh, this is absolutely uh, one of the most important verses in all the Bible. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Um, so, first of all, in the beginning. Uh, that means when time began, beginning and uh, beginning, middle, end, is, is linear and you have a starting uh, point and an end, ending point and there's a timeline and that's time. So at the beginning of time was the word. In other words, when time began, the word was already there. So the word existed before time existed. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God. So it doesn't say that nothing else was with God at that time, but, but I think it's safe to assume that there was nothing else because this is in the beginning, before everything else existed, you had God and the word. So in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. So, and now the Jehovah Witnesses, first of all, I mean, I have a, also a playlist about cults. And one of the cults that I talk about are the, quote, Jehovah's Witnesses. And first of all, I want to say about them is that they are not truly Jehovah's Witnesses. They are false witnesses. They're witnesses against Jehovah, against God Almighty, because they're their witness, their beliefs, their uh, their teachings are all false. Um, I am a true Jehovah's Witness, not as part of the Watchtower Bible Tract Society's uh, system, but a Jeho true Jehovah's Witness in that I'm going to tell you the truth about Jehovah God Almighty, uh, eternal God Almighty, Father God, the Son God, the Holy Spirit God, the Triune God, I'm the one that's going to be the true witness because I'm going to teach you from the, the Bible so you can get the truth about Jehovah or God Almighty. And Jesus Christ is Jehovah God Almighty. However, uh, I'm not a modalist. Uh, I also have videos talking about Trinitarianism versus modalism. And a modalist believes that there's one God and sometimes he, um, he operates 
in a mode uh, as father. Sometimes he operates in the mode of son. Sometimes the mode of operation of God is the Holy Spirit. But he's not acting uh, and being, existing as all three simultaneously as a Trinitarian, as, as I would, as I perceive it and believe it. I believe there's one God, three persons that all exist simultaneously, and yet it's still one God. And there's a lot to be said about that. I'm not going to go into that whole subject right now, but that's the difference between modalism. They think that God just changes forms, like he changes from ice to water to vapor, but it's still just one God. But he's one, he's one thing at a time. He's not ice and water and vapor simultaneously. Um, but the, um, the Jehovah's Witnesses, they did their own translation of the Bible. They used to use the King James Version, but the problem is that it, it, uh, uh, there's just too many things in that King James Version that disagree with their teaching, so they had to get rid of that and write their own Bible. See, what we're supposed to do, we're supposed to read the Bible and um, uh, exegete, which means exit bring out of the bible our our conclusions we uh that we get the truth out of the bible that's called exegesis but what a lot of people do is uh, they they have a, a an opinion and they eisegesis they read it into the bible they make the bible say what they want it to say well the, the jehovah's witnesses cult uh, they uh, they went a step further. They weren't happy with just eisegesis. Jesus. They decided they would just write their own Bible. So all of their false beliefs, they would write the Bible to agree with it. And that's called the, uh, um, their translation is, uh, I forgot the name right now. I'll probably think of it later. Uh, but when they, when they did their translation, first of all, the committee of people that, that did the translation were like high school grade level didn't didn't know Greek didn't were not scholars or anything they just decided to write the Bible in a, in a way that it agreed with their their uh, doctrines so you can't trust that uh, translation but they put in this verse John one one instead of it saying in the beginning was the word and the word was with God. And the word was God. They inserted, inserted one letter, one word, the word A. They phrase it, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was a God. A God. Which they use that, uh, that letter, that word A, to diminish Jesus into something less than God Almighty, that he is some kind of a lesser God. And they also, and you can't come to any other conclusion, is that they, they would be polytheists, thinking that uh, uh, if there's, he's a God, there's God Almighty, and then there's a God beside him, then that, that would be polytheism, believing in more than one God. Uh, but the main thing they want to do is they want to reduce Jesus down from God Almighty down to some lesser God who is a creature who is not eternal. Uh, but that's not their, their translation is the only translation that reads it as a God. Even all the other modern translations that some of you people watching now probably hate at least they don't put in there a God. They leave it as it is. In the beginning was the word. Before time began, the word existed. And the word was with God. You had God in the word. And the word was God. So this word, whoever he, the word is, is God. So you have God 
and you have the Word, who also is God. So do you have two separate gods? Not, uh, not if uh, you hold to the triunity of God, as I do, as most of the church does. Uh, but again, I'm not going to, I don't want to get too sidetracked going into that uh, concept right now. Uh, so let me go into the next verse here. It says, verse 2, the same was in the beginning with God. The same is referencing back to this person that's called the Word. Uh, the same was in the beginning with God. Um, now, let me read verse 1 and 2. I want to look at the Amplified. I'm a KJV firstist, but I like looking at the Amplified uh, because it amplifies it. Uh, and sometimes the things they amplify uh, can be helpful to me. Okay, so first of all, what the Amplified does is they put a title in before the chapters, and they insert subtitles between paragraphs. Uh, the titles, of course, are not scripture. Uh, they're just like editors that inserted it, and it shouldn't be taken as scripture, but according to their interpretation of, of these verses, they say this would be the appropriate title for this these uh, section of verses. And the title that they have here at the beginning is The Deity of Jesus Christ. And it reads, In the beginning, before all time, was the Word, Christ. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God himself. He was continually existing in the beginning, co-eternally with God. So, um, all the exposition amplifying that I did the last 10 minutes, uh, the Amplifieds attempted to do the same kind of a thing. And according to whoever that translator is, I don't know if the Amplified version uses a committee of people or an individual or what, but whoever wrote it and translated it, they're uh, adding their... Uh, amplification, their uh, commentaries, their descriptions, so that it's it's uh, hopefully better understood. And that's what I'm attempting to do right now, because instead of rather than writing it, I'm I'm just speaking it. So I'll read that again. And it says, "In the beginning, before all time, was the Word, Christ, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God Himself." He was continually existing in the beginning, co-eternally with God. So I am absolutely in 100% agreement with the way they phrased it. Uh, so I, I hope now, and now many of you who watch my videos, I mean, you're probably already very, very knowledgeable. Uh, maybe you're totally familiar with everything I've said so far. Uh, but I know that there may be some people watching now or in the future, and they don't understand all this yet. And so this is this is one thing that is the, of the utmost importance that you understand the deity of Jesus Christ, that he is not a created being like the Jehovah's Witness represent. He's not a created being uh, like other people say that he's an angel. He's he's one of the angels, or that he is a, a, a spirit that came out of God, like the Mormons say that Lucifer is a spirit, Jesus was a spirit, you and I are spirits, and that way we're all brothers, spirit brothers, and so they don't elevate Jesus as any different than everybody else. Even Jesus and Lucifer are spirit brothers, and and that means that Jesus is is equal to us, not not God Almighty. Um, this question of who Jesus is and his, him being eternal God Almighty is critically important because he claimed it. Um, if you watch those playlists, 
that uh, I recommended earlier, I, I, there, I, I probably take 20 hours to go into great detail showing you all of his claims. And if Jesus claimed that he is eternal God Almighty, you have three choices. You can believe him. And if you believe he's eternal God Almighty, then he's worthy of our worship. Only God should be worshiped. We should not worship Jesus if he's not God. If he's just a prophet like the Mormons, I mean, like the uh, uh, Muslims say, he's not worthy of our worship. But if, if, if Jesus is who, who he claimed to be, God himself, who became a man, then he's entitled to our worship. Um, I, I make this claim, I stand on that uh, in my statement of faith. And there are certain core doctrines of Christianity that are essential. And you must understand and agree with these things. Otherwise, I don't believe you're even a, a Christian. You're something else. You're, you're a pretender. You're, you're part of like the 95% of Christendom that's wrong about important things. And there are three things that are really, really important. And that is the deity of Christ, that Jesus is not a creature. He is God Almighty eternal and, and that and the uh, the other thing that is essential is that salvation is a free gift that we don't earn it through our religious works it's a free gift we receive because of our faith in Jesus not because we've worked for it and earned it and the third core doctrine is that if you put your faith in Jesus and he gave you eternal life he's not going to ever take it back you can't lose it for any reason so these are the three things that I think that you must agree to, to in order to really be a Christian and understand Christianity uh, and, uh, and have fellowship with, with me at least. That's where I draw the line. We, you, you got to at least understand and agree to those three things. And if you dispute any of those three things, then I can't have fellowship with you. Because uh, fellowship can only happen between believers. And if you don't believe these core doctrines, you're not a believer. You may believe parts of it, but you're only a believer if you understand these basic things of Christianity and believe them. So you don't have to agree, believe a hundred other th things in the Bible. There's a hundred other theological subjects and topics that are... Um, uh, important to, to varying degrees, uh, some very important, some less important, but, but uh, none of them rise to this level of where they're essential. And that's why my slogan is, in essentials, unity. Let's unify around the essentials. Jesus is God, faith alone, for, in Christ alone for salvation, eternal security. Let's unite and agree on that. And that's, uh, uh, but on the non-essentials, on all a hundred other theological subjects and questions, then we should have liberty. We should have freedom to disagree on the other things. And then in all things, grace. Let's, let's be courteous and respectful and loving each other. Even when we disagree on things, let's still be respectful to each other and, and, talk it out and learn from each other. But I'm going, spending a lot of time on this because this question of the deity of Christ is, it's at the top of the list. The deity of Christ. So um, that's how the amplified phrases, and I'll read it again. In the beginning before all time was the word Christ and the word was with God and the word was God himself. He was continually existing in the beginning, co-eternally with God. So the Amplified has it absolutely right. It agrees with the KJV. And it just expounds so that we learn a little bit more completely. Uh, okay, I'm going to go back to the KJV and read the next verse now. Okay. 
in verse 3, it says, All things were made by him, and with him was not anything made that was made. When it says made by him, it's this, this is the subject it's referring back to is this person that's called the word. And one of the things that's really interesting is that at this point, uh, the KJV uh, does not amplify it like the Amplified does and say the word is Christ, but it does, it does just say the word. And he, it says in the beginning was the word. So this, this is the, the word or the term or the title for this person. We're going to find out that the word is actually Jesus, but not yet. You don't understand that yet. So this is one of the arguments for um, et eternal sonship versus e uh, incarnational sonship uh, is that back in, back before time began, Jesus was known not as Jesus, but as, as the word. Um, but I'm, as I said, I have a playlist that goes into like, I don't know, eight or 10 hours on that. Uh, but it, he says, all things were made by him, the word, and without him was not anything made that was made. So uh, this is uh, saying that uh, the word is actually the creator. It says all things were made by him. That's creating. When you make something, you're creating something. So all of creation, including, that would include even time, it says, because in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. It says in the beginning, that's a reference to the beginning of time and the beginning of creation. So... The word created time, space, matter, all of creation, all of the universe. And even if there's more out than the universe, like other dimensions, whatever, everything, it says, it says, all things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. So anything that was made was made by the word. So here we're learning that jesus is referred to as the word that he existed before time he coexisted eternally with god and he is god equal equal to god and it says that uh, uh he is the creator everything that was created everything that was brought into existence uh, the word did it so we learned that jesus is the creator He's eternal, and he is God, equal to equal to God. Um, uh, let's look at verse three in the Amplified. Amplified. Okay, all things were made and came into existence through him. And without him, not even one thing was made that has come into being. All right. So uh, you can see right here off the bat in the beginning of the book of John that uh, the very first thing is the most important thing we need to know that this Jesus that we talk about, this Jesus here, Jesus, one way to heaven. He's not only the one way to get into heaven, but he is God Almighty himself, eternal. Okay, let's go back to the KJV. Look at verse four. In him, in him was life, and the life was the light of men. <coughs> And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. Okay. In him, it's a reference to the word. In the word was life, 
and the light, the life that was in the word, that was the light of men. And the light shineth in the darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. I want to see how that is phrased in the Amplified. Okay, it says, in him was life and the power to bestow life. And the life was the light of men. The light shines on in the darkness, and the darkness did not understand it or overpower it or appropriate it or absorb it and is unreceptive to it. So it says, in him was life and the power to bestow life. This life, uh, th th this goes along with the claim that, that Jesus made when he said, I am the way. He meant the way to get into heaven. I am the truth. He meant the truth that you need to understand and believe if you want to go to heaven and the life, life everlasting, not just life right now for 80 years, but life everlasting. And no man comes unto the Father but by me. So in that verse, I think that's John 14, 6, and it, it, Jesus is making some amazing claims. He says he's the only way to get into heaven. He's, he's the truth that you need to know, need to understand and believe. And he is life itself. If you want to live forever, he's the one that has the power to give you life ever left. And he, he claimed many times, as we'll go through John later on, you'll see that he's making these claims that he has the power to give you life everlasting. And it says, the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not understand it. Um, let me look at that back in the... KJV. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in the darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. Well, there's a saying that comes to mind. I've seen the light. If you've seen the light, it means that you get it. I finally get it. Uh, and the, the, the first thing, and a uh, thing that is of utmost important, importance that you see the light on is who Jesus is and what he's done for you and how you get to heaven through faith in him. We want you to see the light on that. We want you to get it. <laughs> uh, there's a lot of things in the Bible that, uh, you know, I've found out over the years that I suddenly I see the light. Uh, I've referred to it as, as a, an epiphany. I mean, I, I've read the Bible from cover to cover numerous times. I've studied portions of it ex exhaustively for years. And there are times where I read a verse or a portion of verses and suddenly, after years of study, I see the light, an epiphany. In an instant, it's revealed to me. It's a revelation, a revelation from God. Either God has just revealed it to me. Sometimes I see the light because a brother or sister in a discussion says something and it clicked for me. And when Jesus is the light, he is the one that opens up understanding to us because he is the truth. Let me see if I have time for one more verse here. And verse six, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. Okay, now it's gonna start talking about John the Baptist. Uh, verse six, and uh, I'm going to uh, pick up with verse six next time. Uh, but for now, uh, let me close this 
beginning of the study of the, the book of John, uh, the same way I close every one of my Bible studies. And that is the simple message of salvation. Because it, it, to me, it would be a real shame for someone to learn all these theological um, ideas and, and they have the light shine and they, they, oh, I get it, but they didn't understand and learn the thing that is of utmost importance. And that is, how, do I, how am I supposed to get into heaven? What do I have to do? I mean, I, I do want to go to heaven. I've asked a lot of people that question over the years. I've done a lot of street evangelism, street preaching, one-on-one uh, -on -one, uh, witnessing to people here, also here on YouTube. And, and I always like to start by just asking someone, do you want to go to heaven? Now that, that might seem like a real strange question to, to some of you. But the interesting thing is that there is a portion of people that say, no, I don't want to go to heaven. If they say, no, I don't want to go to heaven, then that's fine. Go, go your own way then. And uh, many people don't even believe that there is uh, uh, life after death and the afterlife. They believe you die and you just don't exist and that's the end and, uh, and they don't believe in heaven or hell or anything. So, uh, or some people say, I don't want to go to hell and I want to go to hell. That's where my friends are going to be. Well, for those people, I would just say, fine, go your own way. But um, you might change your mind someday. Someday you might say, wait a second. I do want to go to heaven, but I don't know how to get there. I don't know what I've got to do. So that's, that's what I want you to know now. Uh, if, if you want to go to heaven, what do you have to do to get there? Well, most people in the world, not only today, but throughout all of history, they believe that man goes to heaven based on a merit system. They think that God will somehow judge them and perhaps that he'll put their, uh, their good deeds and bad deeds on a scale. And they, he stacks up their their bad deeds and the scale tilts like this and and then he puts in their good deeds and they, they they hope that the scale will weigh enough on the good side to tilt in their favor and it's an illustration but it, it really uh, correctly shows you the philosophy of man throughout history thinking that somehow if they can be more good than bad somehow the good will outweigh the bad the good will will counteract the bad. And if there is more good than bad, the scale will tilt when they get to go to heaven. But the, there's a lot of problems with that. First of all, that's not what we learn in the Bible. That's a man-made philosophy. That's not biblical Christianity at all. Uh, but uh, let's examine it for a second and see, is it really possible? Could you do that? First of all, the bad things that go on that scale uh, cannot be counteracted by good things. If you do a good deed, it doesn't erase the bad deeds you've done. And then the, the other thing is that uh, um, if you think that you can get more good than bad and the scale will tilt, that means that to tilt the scale in your favor, you just need to be a little bit more good than bad. Like 51% good and 49% bad. I don't think you could even pass your final exam in high school with just 51% right in your life. You know, you're, you, you definitely have to do better than that to have, let, have God accept you. So how, how good would you have to be? How about 70% good? That'll probably maybe give you a passing grade in, in high school, but that's not good enough according to God. What about... 90% or 95%, maybe 99% good. That would, that would be a, like really an outstanding person. They're 99% good. They've only been a, done a few things bad their whole life. Well, the, the, 
problem is that uh, um, the scriptures tells us that uh, if we offended only one point, we're guilty of all. If you if you sin even once, then you can't go to heaven. The standard that we have to meet in order to go to heaven is on the scale there will be zero sins and nothing but good things your whole life. You have to be perfect, flawless. Now, if if you want to go to heaven that way, uh, you got a lot of work ahead of you because you can't have any bad thoughts. Jesus says even bad thoughts are sinful, not just bad actions. So you got to really stop thinking wrong and st uh, stop being angry, stop being jealous, stop being envious, stop being deceitful, stop speaking lies, stop taking things that don't belong to you. Uh, all those things, you have to completely stop it. But then the bad news is even if you had the ability to do that and you can't, it's really already too late for you because how about the past? From the day you're born into the present, present right now, you've already accumulated all these bad things in your life. Bible calls them sin, but so because of sin, Bible says the wages of sin is death. Because of sin, we die. So the standard is perfection, and the Bible says we all fall short. So if the perfection is what we need, and we strive and strive, and we sin, we fit. well, if we sin once, we will, we're lost. Your good deeds are not going to erase the bad deeds. So we, we strive more on all the good deeds, no matter how hard we try. The most religious person